Yeah, thanks, Charlie. So first off today, we have our main speaker, Cheryl Olseth. And in addition to being an experienced climate um, and environmental activist, she's a trained climate reality leader and a director at the Olseth Foundation, where they're working to improve community through the support of arts, education, the environment, and underserved. She'll be presenting on the grasslands of Northern Great Plains and their role in the climate crisis. So without further ado, take it away. Thank All right, you. Cheryl. Let me share here. So just a quick introduction. I'm not a scientist. I did major in environmental biology a long time ago and then um, went on to be in high tech. But in the last um, seven years, I've gotten to come full circle. My, um, we have a family foundation and I've gotten to, we're very passionate about environmental things, which has opened some opportunities. One being on World Wildlife Fund's uh, National Council, we do a lot of support of grasslands conservation out um, mostly through Montana and the Dakotas and goes up a little bit into Canada. Um, so we spend time, we, over the past seven years, I've come to realize how important uh, the grasslands are as we work on climate change because it holds a lot of carbon. Um, so let me go to the next slide. So here's just a beautiful picture of the prairie and all those East Coasters who think it's flyover country have clearly not been there. I guess you can't quite see. Um, I also wrote down some names in other countries. There's grasslands across the whole world and it's one of the most endangered ecosystems, the temperate um, area in particular, which is all the green on this slide. The purple are savannas, steppes, different types of grasslands uh, that are in more tropical areas. And it actually, between the two, it makes up 25% of the land's um, surface area. And it, it holds more, well, I'll get to that in a second. It actually holds more carbon um, in the root system than even the rain. It's three times what the rainforest holds if you take it in totality across the world. And so there's, the little chart on the right um, shows different ecosystems and the green is, even though it's not very dense, it, in, as you take it across, it's you know, three times as much as the rainforest down on the bottom. And why does it, have, why does it hold so much carbon? Well, if you look on the left of this root system, the the Kentucky bluegrass, which is our lawns, are over on the left, and that <laughs> there isn't much root system, and that's why those little beetles, if you've seen people's lawns that have been decimated, doesn't take long for them to eat through those roots. But these other plants, uh, it goes down up to 20 feet deep, a lot of these roots. And there's 1,600 varieties of grasses, sedges, and wildflowers just in our northern Great Plains, um, which there isn't any other ecosystem in the um, North America that has such a variety of uh, plants. And it, it also, on the top, hosts a whole variety of important species that which I'm gonna quickly go through some of the main um, species. First, we've got the bison, which of course you all know they were decimated, but they're quite amazing animals. Um, they can run as fast as a horse. They can easily jump over a six foot fence. They've evolved to uh, weather the climate extremes of the Great Plains from really cold winters to really hot summers. And they make it possible for other species. So this bison on the left 
is creating a wallow, which is a deep depression in the grasslands that every time it rains, it fills with water. So it's a little water support for various mammals. It, they fill up with amphibians from frogs to toads and a whole variety of different plants. And so without the bison, those wa wallows disappear and they're actually quite critical to um, the health of the landscape. Then the, there's the pronghorn, which are North America's fastest mammal. Um, they are the only one of only a few species left in the lower 48 that actually do long distance migrations with the exception of birds, obviously, but for mammals. And WWF has actually tracked them that sometimes they move 250 miles in any direction to escape harsh winters. They actually don't do very well when there's really deep snow. Probably 10 years ago, 90% of pronghorn were killed off in one winter. So they have a very up and down um, uh, lifespan. And this is a swift fox, which are critically endangered and it's North American smallest canid. It's about as big as a house cat. And they actually like the sh uh, more of the short grass prairie where they can hide and see prey. Um, and they, uh, WWF is actually working on restoration and recovery of this uh, cute little fox. And of course the prairie dogs are another important species. Um, who live in, they live in a gr in groups, they share food, they help each other avoid predators, and they groom one another. Um, and they're especially important to this little black-footed ferret, which is the most endangered mammal in North America. They thought they were extinct until they found um, a group of them on a ranch in Wyoming in the, I think, 1982. So that's me and my sister with a U.S. Fish and Wildlife um, biologist who spent his life trying to bring these this species back. And believe it or not, they have to be vaccinated against the plague. They only, they're my main uh, protein source is um, prairie dogs. And on average, they need a thousand acres of prairie dog town to, for one ferret to survive. So they're, they're having a rough go. There's maybe 400 in the wild. It hasn't gone up much in the 30 years that this biologist has worked on these um, little little guys. In fact, you may have seen there was some article they cloned a black-footed ferret recently, but I don't know that much about that. And then uh, grassland birds. Um, I don't know how many of you are birders, but on the left is a sage grouse and then the prairie chickens on the bottom in the top is a little Sprague's pipit, which is also quite um, endangered. And they're just teeny tiny, like one ounce. They are five inches, but they travel 3000 miles in their migration. And this is just a quick slide. I'm sure many of you saw how many of the birds have been decimated in the last 50 years. And grassland birds are actually the most uh, endangered of all types of bird species in North America. And lastly, um, the grasslands are critical for bumblebees. There's uh, 20,000 different species of bumblebee across the world. And the grasslands have the most in um, the Americas. And they're the only, our bumblebees are the only ones who can raise their body temperatures by, they move their 
wing muscles and it raises their temperature when it's cold. Um, so these four, um, some of the species I just talked about is they're, they only have about one to 3% of their historic numbers. And it's primarily just from pure eradication. Prairie dogs are often poisoned um, by ranchers, um, over hunting, loss of habitat and development. So why, why do these species and the grasslands matter when we all care about climate change and carbon and, um, and that's what I wanna get to is that if we don't do something, we're gonna end up in, if we don't do something to save the grasslands, we're gonna end up like the 1930s with the Dust Bowl and which was one of our worst um, human induced catastrophes, nature catastrophes and climate change, I think is far outweighing the dust bowl. And the level of carbon that's uh, kept in the grasslands is just so immense that what we're doing is converting it over to row crops. And every time we convert, carbon goes up and we lose the sequestration ability of all that root system. And so one of the things our foundation is working on with WWF is how do we reduce um, this conversion? As crop price, when crop prices go up, of course, more there's more tillover. So this is a map of what the current Northern Great Plains is. Um, WWF developed a scientific method with satellites to look at conversion every year. This was about four years ago. And they determined we're losing a million acres a year out of 127 million acres. And you can see it goes all the way down into Mexico and way up into Canada. And actually Canada had converted quite a bit, you can see with this brown. Um, and when the Canadian government just <laughs> saw this first plow print report, they actually put in a lot of laws that they can't turn over um, this grassland anymore. And their conversion has slowed considerably. So you can see mostly what it's being replaced with wheat, corn, and soy. And often the, the land that's converted is not very tillable for long-term. It's the best land like, you know, in Minnesota down here was tilled over first and it remains the best, healthiest farmland. So it doesn't really make sense other than prices will drive this turnover. So there's different ways to sort of try to mitigate some of these climate issues. And the mo number one is just avoiding this grassland conversion. And another way is putting in cover crops so that the, it doesn't just blow away between plantings. And then there's just a variety of other, and like I said, I'm not a farmer and I'm so, um, you know, I understand windbreaks, but some of this, like the biochar, probably some of, I don't know if Lee is on the call tonight, he probably can explain it better, but it's holding, it's a way of converting things into carbon down in the soil, a chemical reaction. So when you look at um, the grasslands, ownership right now, about 70% is privately held and that's ranching, 10% is tribal, and then about 20% is government. And so the best, we're finding the best way to keep this grassland, as we like to say, right side up is to work with the tribes and work with the ranchers. 
and ranchers um, really have kept the land quite pollution free. There was a big study done on the Missouri River and wherever there's ranching, there was very little water pollution um, versus as you get more into row crops and there's more fertilizer and, and ranchers are really proud of their land and they wanna keep it healthy. And so they've been, it's taken time, but they're willing to work on community conservation and the tribes are the same and they're doing a lot with species restoration. So basically, all of this uh, way to save the grasslands is based on com is community based conservation. And one of the things WWF has learned over decades is that if you don't have buy in from the people that live there, conservation just doesn't work. And it takes a long time, but it pays off. So on the grasslands, we're starting with this habitat loss, the decline in species, and there's also economic and social challenges, such as closing of schools, um, which is hard on ranching families if their kids have to be on a bus for, you know, an hour each way. Um, in a lot of these small towns, many of those services have closed. So, oh, I can't, hold on a second. Um, so we started with building um, a rapport just by listening and engaging. And it's the same whether it's a tribe or a ranching community. And that allows you to develop the capacity to start making changes in how um, how they do their ranching techniques. Oh, my slide is stuck. Oh, there we go. Um, and then we put together some plans um, and then galvanized networks to make it more scalable. Because as you could see on those earlier maps, this is a huge amount of area to keep intact. And once you have all these things, you have healthy grasslands and thriving wildlife and happy people. So just two quick examples. Um, the, there's 15 tribes that live through the Great um, Plains and it's millions and millions of acres. And the nice thing is it's there, each of these reservations has, you know, it's intact, like especially this is a lot of acreage here. Um, so they all came together and made a treaty that they want to restore some of this grassland and species and bring back um, the buffalo. And that's what we now have five herds um, and a new one just went in down here uh, of a thousand bison or more. They need at least a thousand to be genetically pure. You think there's a lot of bison, but most of them have been um, bred with cattle. So they're not the genetically pure bison, but now there's probably 20,000 throughout the country that um, have those original genes. Um, and then we've been working with different ranching communities to bring back cropland. This doesn't sound like much, eight, thousand acres, but this is cropland that shouldn't have ever been tilled and these ranchers now want to bring it back. And so corporations, McDonald's, um, Cargill, Walmart, actually the Airwick, the owner of Lysol, they're all donating money to pay for seed to bring the grasslands back. It's incredibly expensive to reseed once it's been tilled over. And they're also gonna study met the best methodologies to measure the carbon sequestration and um, baseline monitoring for soil carbon, the water filtration and how the biodiversity 
And when I was talking earlier about um, working together, these all these different ranching um, organizations, initially they were very skeptical of anyone coming that talks about conservation or environment, but over actually 12 years, we have really strong alliances. Um, many of these ranchers host us. They have learned new techniques on moving their cattle around to keep the grasslands healthy, just like when basically the bison, the cattle have replaced the bison. And I just wanna add, it's another complicated, you know, people say, oh, we shouldn't be eating meat, but we do need ranchers to keep the um, grasslands intact, which is all part of the climate um, story. So like anything, it's more complicated than just um, saying don't ever eat meat again. Um, there's certainly sustainable beef and we've met with ranchers, they, they lose sleep over as they call it fake meat, the impossible burgers and things. But um, it's a complicated issue. And then we just need to keep advocating Congress to make sure they protect this grasslands. Um, they've actually, there's declarations to save other parts of the world like the rainforest. And um, we're fighting to have a declaration to save our prairies. And we've got support from companies, ranchers, tribes, <coughs> academics, and um, many NGOs, Nature Conservancy is doing a lot. So that's um, my short, short talk on <laughs> um, saving the grasslands. Now I just, I'll stop. Hey, Cheryl, a quest, question for you. Um, uh, grazing animals like, uh, you know, wild animals like bison and, and grazing cattle, aren't they critical too to the general health of the grasslands, you just, they, the grasslands need those grazing animals, do they not? Ab absolutely. And we're never going to have 60 million bison again, but cattle, when they're, if you take cattle and you move them around, they can function in a very similar manner as a bison, other than they don't do, they don't wallow and things like that. But, um, but they're working hard on bringing back enough bison. I've been out on one of the reservations and we were look. I mean, it was like being in dances with wolves, that movie looking down on this massive herd of bison that this particular tribe hadn't had bison for 130 years. Most of their kids had never even seen a buffalo and um, one of the, there was a group of elderly women who were trying to bring bison back. And one of them just said, now we can start healing. They're so integrated to their culture. She said she felt that this is how they start healing issues with, you know, having lost their original land. And um, it was really quite moving. But yeah, you do need all these species and birds are, it's quite frightening how the bird populations are just decimated on the grasslands. Um, Cheryl, so those were beautiful pictures. I had a question, uh, you mentioned that if you added all the grasslands together that the root systems sequester uh, three times as much as a rainforest. Was that as all the rainforests or just as the all, Amazon? All the rainforests. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. Oh. Um, I have a citation of that. I I can of the patent of the study that was done on that. Um, I can get that. Oh no, that's good enough. <laughs> so one one quick comment for everybody: if we um, just to keep on schedule, we're going to keep going. But Cheryl, are, are you okay with staying for for a couple of minutes after? Oh, um, absolutely. Great, we generally keep the meeting open. So if uh, I do have some additional questions, but if we can hold them until we, we finish up the regular agenda and then we uh, can come back and and uh, uh, socialize a little bit and ask questions. Hey Cheryl, I had a question for you. Um, and, and 
you know, I, I don't know what, what you know about this, but I read recently that um, the, this proliferation of nitrogen that's been used in, on farms and, uh, and throughout the world has had a huge impact on grasslands globally. Um, and, um, and not a good, not a good effect, right? And thus the, the need for, um, you know, these grazing animals and such that apparently they can keep up with it in the uh, savannas in Africa, but certainly not in the, in the Great Plains. Do you, do you know much about this problem that, that with nitrogen having an impact in, in uh, growing these grasses to the point where they're choking out a lot of the other uh, more fragile species and the like? I don't, but I will find out for you. Okay. But um, it I'll is interesting. Yeah. It takes so long to recover. Um, one, there's a rancher we spent a couple days at his place and right there was a settler next to their property like a hundred years ago, they went bust and you could see the exact line of where they had tilled up, even though it had been growing over for a hundred years and it still looked completely different to the untilled. And some scientists say they think it takes a thousand years to come back to natural prairie. Ooh. I know, mm -hmm. to get full species diversity. So we don't want it, with, so we can keep it from being plowed over. That's a good thing mm -hmm. we're there today. Uh, Cheryl, um, when you were talking about, you know, the um, admonition to don't eat beef and it's not that simple. Um, I always, when I buy beef, I look for grass fed. And I wondered if grass fed uh, beef doesn't produce the amount of methane that the uh, feedlot cows do. It, it's much better than putting them in a feedlot for 18 months because you're not growing gr crops to feed the, I mean, they're just grazing off the grass. And, and there, are, um, there are ranchers who will ship directly, like they slaughter right at their farm and We'll send it directly. I actually buy bison from, it's called Wild Idea, and they slaughter it right out in the field. And um, anyway, it's really excellent. And mm -hmm. he's, he's got a okay. website, which okay. he's also an author and has a, he's a very good writer, Dan O'Brien. <laughs> He's got a lot of books, some fiction, but this he'll he talks about how he converted from ranch ranching with cattle over to bison and what caused him to do the, do that. And okay. Anyway, he's okay. Thank you. A question for Cheryl. Uh, you talked about the dust bowl. You know, as climate changes and as more uh, grassland is cultivated, unfortunately. Uh, what is the chance of another dust bowl? What are you hearing? Actually, it's quite good. I mean, they're finding that there was just a study that came out, I think, from N NASA satellites that the top layer is just blowing away again. Right. That they're, most of the, um, they're losing. So I don't know if we'd end up like those pictures from the Dust Bowl, but I think it's pot feasible if they plow up enough of it. When you think of 170 million acres, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of it isn't that, you know, really healthy, or it's a different kind of soil. I shouldn't say healthy versus not healthy. It's just, we think of that black dirt here that, um, it's more, it's dry, more arid. I mean, a grassland is probably gets less than eight, 20 inches of rain a year. I think a mm -hmm. desert is 10 or less inches. Lee, and do Cheryl. you know anything about that? Nice to see you, by the way. Yeah, um, yeah if you plow up a huge area, not only do you 
remove the vegetation, but you change the color so that it absorbs more solar radiation, mm -hmm. which probably played a big role in the in the dust bowl. And then after all the black topsoil blew away, it wasn't as dark, and then the whole thing came to an end. Um, but um, yeah, it was interesting that the whole world didn't warm up at that time. Though. It was actually a cold period, um, slightly cold in the history of the earth. Um, and um, winters were really cold during that time too. But it, it all had to do with that color being, that dark color being exposed during the summer, making it really hot and removing a lot of vegetation all at once. So in, in Sherburne County, um, I found a clipping from the early 40s of, uh, in Big Lake Township, where they had to get the snow plow out to plow the sand off the road in July mm -hmm. because of wind. Mm -hmm. And there are Christmas tree farms up in Sherburne County and that all comes out of um, that the 1930s because they found that the pine trees would grow. Um, and Sand Dune State Forest was planted because, you know, to keep it from blowing away, to keep the ground from blowing away. We had in the in the Sherburn History Center. There's a huge, a huge photograph of um, two guys riding in a tree plant, planter, just planting the um, whatever kind of pine it was that they planted. They planted something like six million trees in 20 years. If you've ever tried to dig up the pr prairie, I mean, it is it's amazing to me how quickly they actually dug all that la land up. I mean, the root systems are just so deep and thick. And I mean, to think probably most of them did it kind of by hand over, mm -hmm. just unbelievable. Well, didn't those pioneers build sod houses out of the, you know, cutting it out in blocks and building their houses out of it as part of it? This is, this is from my childhood, little house my on the prairie. My grandma lived in a sod house <laughs> when she was young. Um, yeah. Hey, Cheryl. Cheryl thank oh, go ahead, Greg. Oh, um, thank you. Cheryl, thank you for your presentation. It's It was fascinating and interesting. I love the, the, the slides and I'm really happy to learn about your organization and your connection with the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, I was involved in... Uh, uh, grassland uh, research for a, a few years in southwestern Wisconsin. And as I think many of you know that in Minnesota and the Upper Great Lake or the Midwest here. Our grazing lands, um, they're generally divided between more conventional grazing, which is kind of what in many of the ranchers do, but they have out know, west or in the Great Plains, but they have a lot larger acreage, of course, to allow the cattle to, to roam. But the rotational and the paddock system is much more common to apply here as a conservation practice to integrate the, the, the organic matter back into the soil structure. And I, fo it's, I found that there was quite a variety or a varying amount of organic matter that uh, would accumulate across these different types of paddocks in southwestern Wisconsin and very much dependent on the density of the cows, of course but also the, the species of the cow, uh, I should say the, the, the breed of the cow, uh, gir, uh, Guernsey um, or Jerseys versus Holsteins, et cetera. What did, did you see any patterns or do you know of any patterns on the type of stock that are being used in the ranch lands? And, you know, like white-faced Herefords, for example, versus black uh, Angus or some other breed that um, are performing better for minimizing their impact? on some of the grasslands? I think it's less on what the cattle is and more how often they move them around. They have the little, they set up the temporary fencing and they move, some move them every, you know, five to 10 days. Mm -hmm. And um, and they even, a lot of these um, ranchers now will put their cattle. So when like the grouse are lecking, they, make sure they're far away from um, 
the lecking sites and they open their ranch or ranches for uh, birders. It's another income mm -hmm. stream, but it seems to be less. I mean, they haven't less on the cattle, what type of cattle and more how they move them around. Uh, so sure. they really wanted, there's many ranchers who are very conservation minded. Mm -hmm. Cheryl, kind of along that line, did you talk with people who also are integrating sheep and maybe even goats, but especially sheep in this area in with the... Actually, it's funny that I haven't um, been to any sheep farm, but they just, WWF just hired a woman to take over their ranching initiative and she has a sheep farm. And I just met her virtually on Zoom and she was going to go be a diplomat. She had gone mm -hmm. into the foreign service and suddenly realized she didn't want to leave Eastern Montana. And she <laughs> took over her parents' ranch, which is a sheep ranch. That's something so to I'll look into. I'll learn more about it yeah. in the coming months. <laughs> There's yeah. a place called Bear Ranch in, um, in Northeastern California and into Nevada that's doing some really interesting work and they've already done some testing of sequestration and so on. So um, I think it could be very interesting because sheep and cattle, the hooves are different, the way they, you know, the impact on the soil and all kinds of things is very different. Mm -hmm. So anyway, yeah. just uh, no. just an interesting thought. What it thing I know reminds, me, reminds me of the, um, the cowboy movies of the 50s where the, the sheep herders and the ranchers would get in these big wars. <laughs> yeah. I had a question for Lee. Back when you gave your presentation on the effect of uh, climate change on the forest, and you're talking about in the worst case, or in the bad scenario, high carbon scenario, we're to lose, I think, the conifers. H how soon could that affect like around uh, the, the tall trees around uh, Itasca State Park? Um, the, the effects there would come pretty early because they're pretty close to the prairie forest border there. Okay. Um, and actually a lot of trees are showing disease problems already because they're out of whack with the climate. So conceivably, I mean, if, if things don't change, we could lose the big trees uh, by the end of the century then or not? Or... Oh, before the end of the century, for sure. If we're on the business as usual scenario, I would say by 20 2070, we would look like Kansas. I think that'd be a really good uh, uh, icon to, to use, like the polar bear. You know, we don't want to lose these uh, these trees. So. Yep, and we would be able to resequester all that carbon in the soil in the new grasslands that would be established, but that's going to take several centuries. And in the meantime, all the CO2 from all the trees that die goes into the atmosphere. So it's a it's a timing problem. You can't we resequester it very fast. Um, you, you can get it out really quick, but you can't put it back very fast.